Nobody can do everything, but we can all do something, as Jan Eliasson said. Now, to educate you even more and go into more uh, deeply understanding of the issue, let me introduce Mr. Marcus Eriksson, who's a research director and co-founder of the Five Jars Institute. A big round of applause for Marcus. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for this opportunity to share with you the state of the science on plastic marine pollution. I've been involved in this issue for about 18 years, and I still can't get it to work. There we go. So about 18 years ago, I was on Midway Atoll, the Mid-Pacific, with 14 high school students. We were there learning bird ecology, and you know, to our, our dismay, every single skeleton we saw of these albatross, there's a little pile of plastic pouring out. And Midway Atoll, a little small island, makes nothing plastic. It was all coming from somewhere else. And that galvanized my, my belief that this issue, it's, it's global, and we must do something. That was 18 years ago. So today, to sit here in front of you and, uh, and, and see this much activity is, uh, is very heartwarming. But this is the work that we began doing 10 years ago, when there were still some unanswered questions. And the big question was, Okay, everyone's talking about this fictitious island of trash, but where is the plastic? How much is out there? And what is the impact? So that began a series of about 20 expeditions we've gone around the world, dropping that net in the water, dragging it across the ocean surface, counting and weighing and classifying the particles, and, and trying to understand that distribution. And like I said, it is global. But each time we crossed one of these subtropical gyres, there's a heat mat heat map, and the orange and red blotches are where the accumulation should be according to current modeling. So we use our data to populate the model, and we were discovering all around the world the same thing. There were small, broken down microplastic particles. There was no island of trash the media had sensationalized. So we did this, and we published that paper. It was the first global estimate of all plastics, all sizes, and all oceans. But interestingly, the smallest particles of plastic, because we divided our plastic in four size categories, the big things as big as beach balls, the smaller bits as big as water bottles, then the things as big as a grain of rice, and then the smallest dust sized particles, as big as, let's say, a little flake of pepper. We found the smallest particles, a hundred times less on the ocean surface than expected. And it made us realize, publishing this, that the ocean surface is not the final resting place for plastics. In fact, this big number, a quarter million tons, is less than 1% of one year's production of plastics in the world today. It's not staying on the surface. It's fragmenting, and we're finding that many organisms are eating it, and that when they excrete it, those fecal pellets sink to the seafloor. So the seafloor is likely the final sink. So we did this, and then we did more research since then. And we're going to places like the Arctic, where there are abundant fibers everywhere, uh, subsurface on the surface, frozen in sea ice. We went to the North Atlantic, sailing from the Bahamas to Bermuda, across to New York City. We collected 38 surface samples, and when we got to New York City, that's the bottom corner here, there was more plastic there than all the previous samples combined, showing that it's our cities that are ejecting all this plastic into our, our marine environment. And the top picture here was the Great Lakes, where we found these little tiny, perfectly round spheres of plastic, little blue and purple and yellow pieces. They were the, the beads, the microbeads from facial scrubs. We found it, we published the paper, and through an amazing coalition of people, policymakers, industry, uh, artists, sailors, activists, educators, we were able to put a bill in front of President Obama three years after publication. And it was the first national bill to ban microbeads, showing the power of collaboration. It was quite amazing. So that that 10-year-old idea of fictitious islands of trash, there's a need to change the narrative. And we have been proposing this, called a smog of microplastics. When you think of smog, you think of air pollution. You know, trillions of particles in the air, each carries its own burden of toxicity and wide distribution. Well, microplastics in the ocean are the same, the same thing in a very general sense. But when you think of smog, you don't think of a lovely island where you can go and plant a flag and buy real estate. You think of pollution, you think of a problem, and you think of prevention. 
You don't think of going out there and picking up all the small particles. You think of stopping the source. That's why we think this narrative is a better way to frame the research. But our first expedition, my first expedition out in the ocean, was not a research voyage. So 10 years ago, we thought to do a public stunt. So we took a, an airplane, we put 15,000 plastic bottles under it, took a bunch of broken sailboat masts from marinas and made a square deck, made an A-frame and hung a piece of sail. And with no motor and no chase boat, no support vessel, we were towed off the coast of Los Angeles. And I was thinking, we, we were going to demonstrate what plastic trash from the California coast, where it goes, how the gyre currents move, and get the public paying attention to this issue. I thought it might take us three, three weeks, maybe four, five, if I'm unlucky. Three months later, we drift into Waikiki, Hawaii, a very long, long sail. Uh, the good news is it still floats. We, I still have the boat. And we can consider this presentation my official request to join the Volvo Ocean Race next year. If there's a prize for last, dead last, like five years to get, to get around the world. But when we got halfway across the ocean, we were out of food, eating a lot of peanut butter and fish, not the best combination. But we, I caught this fish, and I filleted the fish, opened the stomach, and little plastic bits popped out. This is the, perhaps the only important photograph from that, that little expedition on our homemade raft. It's been seen around the world, but it really galvanized for me the fact that there was microplastics everywhere. This was 10 years ago. The distribution was global, and the impact was horrendous on, on, on our fisheries. So we've been doing studies on these impacts. We looked at the bite marks on plastics. If you walk your beach anywhere around the world, you might see interactions of animals and plastics from bite marks. And we were able to match in the North Atlantic some triggerfish and sea turtles to different shapes of the bite marks. But it goes beyond that. Over 200 species have been found of fish to ingest plastics, including almost 50 commercial fish, many uh, other arthropods and, and mollusks and bivalves, and lots of commercial products. So it's going now from the ecological impact to the potential human health impact. I went to this desert in Dubai and Kuwait uh, about two years ago. I was in the first Gulf War. Uh, you said you, meant, you met Saddam Hussein. Um, I was in Kuwait. Uh, I was one of the Marines on the ground, covered in oil, uh, liberating that country a long time ago. And that's kind of where my, my environmentalism was galvanized, to know its impacts. I went back two years ago on a different mission to understand microplastics in the Gulf of Arabia. And I met a veterinarian in Dubai, and he said, you want to see plastics, come with me. So we turned around and went deep into the desert, and on top of these little hills, I could see piles of white bones here and there. He studies camels. We walk down to one, he pulls a rib out of the ground, hands it to me, he grabs another, and he says, start digging. So we're digging inside the rib cage of this camel, deep about 60 miles into the desert, and we pull out of this animal a mass of plastic bags about as big as my arms. And he said, about 15 years ago, the first camel came in with plastic in the stomach. And now half the camels come in. And most of them don't survive. And he said, the impacts, it's not just the ocean that you're focused on. It's on land as well. And it became clear to me the entire biosphere globally is impacted or interacting with our trash. Where is it all coming from? Well, we know that since, it, since the, the history of plastics, about 8.3 billion tons of plastics have been made. The, a lot of it is still stuck in our closets. It's in construction materials, about a quarter of it. Not very much is actually getting recycled, but 600 million tons since the history of plastics on our planet. A lot of it's getting lost. Where is it going? Throughout the ocean environment, in all biomes, we're seeing it in all environments, on the seafloor, the sea surface, the midwater column, riverbanks, in sediment, in biota, even the atmosphere, we're losing microfibers. So again, the ubiquity of plastics worldwide. Now, this is important. Is there harm? Does it really matter? It's a great study by a colleague, Chelsea Rockman, published in 2015. The blue squares, the darker the blue square, the more published papers on the impact. And it's by the size and the, uh, the organizational structure, from subatomic to populations. We know a lot about plastics this big affecting individual organisms. 
What we now know, and just three years later, look at the same study again, we're seeing much, much more in that same area, products or particles this big in individual organisms. What we're finding more, though, and what's important is to understand, are there whole populations getting impacted by all sizes of particles? So there are some data gaps. There are some debates about whether microplastics matter to cause harm or not. I would say the case is not clear. We need more field studies of population impacts. So where is the science now? A few things. We want to understand the sources and solutions of plastics of all sizes. Where is the source? Where is the sink? And how do we solve it? Where is the missing plastic? Where is it? Is it the seafloor? Is it in sediment? Is it in biota? Where is the final resting place? What's the fate of synthetic chemistry? Population level impact and human health. These are the key research questions. That's the frontier for the science now. Now I'm going to go into some general ideas. What I'm seeing, I've just come back from uh, a UN event in, in Bangkok where we're looking at um, harmonizing some standards for how we measure plastics. So I want to talk about sort of what, I'm, what I've observed as, as high-level solutions. We all know about the circular economy. One example I have seen where I think we can really make a difference is looking at remote communities. When we were in the Arctic, we were trawling. I was trawling in front of a community at 72 degrees north, way up there looking for microplastics. And then I look up, and you see a little plume of smoke. Their landfill was on fire. And I thought, OK, what, what's the impact of microplastic research while well, they're burning plastics? When I got to talk with them, they said, it's the linear economy. It's the one directional flow of packaging and products to remote parts of the world, remote islands, remote communities. There's a need, an economic need to understand, reverse those logistics, get those materials back. Every island I've gone to, and perhaps you've seen it yourself, they deal with trash with a match, or they'll bury it, or they'll push it into a stream. And I've seen that everywhere that I go. That's one good point of intervention that I think we could, we could focus on. Building zero waste communities. I had a chance to walk with this man. He's an, an ocean voyager from Samoa. He had just arrived in Wellington, New Zealand on a waka, and we walked up to the parliamentary steps to ban plastic bags. It was a march. And what, what I learned from him is what's happening around the world, and this is one great intervention point, are decentralized waste management. What we've all seen in many big cities is an is a unregulated dump where trash gets dumped the little fires here, scavengers, waste pickers picking up trash. That's a, that's a centralized system. The decentralized MRF, it's working very well. In Southeast Asia, there are a few organizations that have created more than 1,000 villages that are doing their own waste management, which means they get really good at composting, really good at recycling, and the residuals. They ask themselves, do we need this? Do we need these, these disposable diapers or sachet packets, little purple chai cups? So this decentralized model, it's scalable, it's economically possible, and it's working. It's already happening around the world. More of these can really help this issue. Aligning and focus. In the last couple of years, we're seeing more research, not on plastic in the gyres, the work that I've been doing. It's more about land to sea connections. And we're seeing this happen. These are from Jambeck and Le Breton. Great studies for alignment. And I'll mention the last two slides. I just came back from uh, this one event in Bangkok, a working group, we're trying to harmonize methods. So everyone, every city, every NGO is measuring plastic in the same way. You can't mitigate what you can't measure. So right now that's happening with this working group is to harmonize all those methodologies. It's happening right now. It's pretty exciting. This should be out the end of this year, a good booklet on, on standard methodologies. And the second is this working group. It's looking at all the ways we're trying to solve issues what does data show works the best? If, you, if you're trying to deal with plastic bags, is it a ban? Is it a better kind of bag? Is it better recycling? What does the data show? So these two working groups, um, I believe, are, are a great path forward. And again, having been this issue for 18 years, uh, working with students and pulling plastic, bag, plastic products out of bird skeletons 18 years ago and being here today, I can tell you I am full of optimism that we can solve this soon. And it comes from amazing collaborations like this here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, just a couple of questions before we leave you. Now, you're full of optimism. So what do you think? We have people here from government, from business, from uh, civil society. What is your advice? What should these people do to make this happen that you were describing? 
I think one is to get science, real science, not fake science. Get real science and use that for, 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 for good, smart policy. Um, one example, when I was, like I said, I was in Bangkok walking around uh, some of the neighborhoods and seeing little tiny small rivers full of plastic waste um, um, and raw, raw sewage as well, and thinking something has to start. And one start might be the, the single-use packaging. Well, not, not might be, should be. I went to 7-Eleven just two days ago, and there were individual bananas wrapped in plastics. Individual in, bananas. In 7-Eleven. In 7-Eleven, right. In Bangkok. So, yes, I think getting rid of the single-use pla plastic, these, these products don't capture the negative externalities, what happens beyond that point of purchase. But EU had some proposition on this issue, single-use plastics, just a couple of weeks ago, right? Yes. Want to, yes. Well, Is that's that a happening. Good way? I think around the world, you see there are over 60 countries are, are passing legislation about plastic mm -hmm. bags, and we're seeing more on straws and on foam polystyrene. It's all the single-use packaging. I mean, plastic is great from in, in technologies and safety equipment uh, in hospitals, but the single-use throwaway culture is, is one place to zero in and end that, especially the decentralized MRF model. They're taking a good look at single-use plastics because they don't biodegrade and they're not that valuable as recyclables. So use real science to make good policy. And as individuals, what can we do except not using the straws and single-use plastic things? The one thing that comes to mind, I always uh, uh, tell people, first is support everything happening within your community. But for the individual, look at your grocery list, what you buy. On your grocery list, you can easily say, I'm not just buying the product, I'm buying the packaging. And do I need this? Where does it go? Make a conscious purchasing choice. But then the bigger picture is support the, the global movement that's going to eradicate the problem. Marcus Eriksson, thank you very much for joining us. Here. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.